Before I get started, I wanted to make sure everyone knows the Buy Local Vermont program is now open. This means Vermonters can go to thinkvermont.com local and sign up for a $30 deal for one of more than 1,300 Vermont businesses. This initiative was passed by the legislature early, earlier this summer with a goal of injecting a half a million dollars of federal relief funds into our local businesses across the state. And while it's not nearly enough, it's a start. Now, as I'm sure we're all aware, today is the first day of school. And because these are not normal times, things will look and feel much different. But the start of the school year is still exciting for kids. I wish all students the very best as they start the new year. And don't forget to treat your classmates, staff, and teachers well, just the way you want to be treated. As we know, some schools will be in person and full time, while most will have some days in person and some days online. I know this hasn't been easy on anyone, but my hope is that by giving schools flexibility, those who aren't comfortable with five days a week at this point will take this time and build faith in their in-person systems and protocols. And with this confidence, transition to more in-person days as the year moves ahead. As I said on Friday, I want all parents, school administrators, teachers and support staff, and concerned Vermonters to remember we have an incredibly strong team at the Department of Health who have been helping us manage this crisis since February. They have strong protocols in place and a proven record of protecting Vermonters and making sure we're ready for this restart. But again, even though we are by far the safest state in the nation, with the lowest number of cases and the lowest positivity rates, we know there will be bumps in the road and there will be cases tied to schools. We also know how important this is for our kids. And we're here to work with schools as we take this step forward to respond to and contain cases just as we've done throughout this pandemic. Now, Dr. Levine will talk about some new testing initiatives this morning as well. I mention this because a strong testing system and using these tests to activate our contact tracing team is key to finding and containing cases and clusters before they become outbreaks, which is critical to keeping our schools and economy open. We've been building and strengthening these programs for months, but we're not resting on our laurels. And Dr. Levine will share more on this in a few minutes. We also have a strong team at the Agency of Education and experienced, talented superintendents, principals, teachers, and support staff across the state who are rising to this challenge to support our kids. And getting back into school is just one of those challenges. As we heard from pediatricians throughout the summer, last year's remote learning affected our kids and not in a good way. And now the work begins to see just how deep those impacts were which is why it's so important for all of us to work together to get kids back on track. I know in my heart, this is the goal we all share. And Secretary French will now talk more about this work. Secretary French. Uh, thank you, Governor. Good morning. Today is the first day of school for the 2020-21 school year. Uh, like every start to a new school year, this day brings renewed optimism and excitement as we look forward to greeting our students and beginning the work of our schools, which is so central not only to their development, but also to the vitality of our communities. Six months ago, we abruptly closed our schools as an emergency social mitigation strategy to stop the spread of the virus. Like all states, Vermont had to begin the hard work of achieving some measure of viral suppression by shutting down many aspects of our society to prevent its transmission. Back then, many states announced temporary closure of their schools. Some announced they would close their schools until April vacation. Others announced their intention to reopen schools in May. Vermont took bolder action and announced the closure of its schools for the remainder of the school year. 
This required our school system to rapidly develop remote learning plans for all students. This was very challenging work and highlighted issues of equal opportunity that no doubt existed prior to the emergency, <clears throat> but certainly were exacerbated by bandwidth issues, inadequate access to computer hardware, and lack of robust online learning platforms. Despite these challenges with the remote learning, our priority was getting control of the virus. Our collective work has paid off, with Vermont now having a high degree of viral suppression. We also made significant investments in our testing and contact tracing capacity to ensure we can rapidly identify new cases of the virus and prevent them from spreading. The ability of our health department to contain the virus has been proven when clusters emerged in Winooski and Fairhaven. And now, with the successful reopening of our higher education system, we can have the confidence we are ready to take the next step in reopening our K-12 system. <clears throat> it is from an appreciation of this context that we made plans to reopen our K-12 schools. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our plans are grounded in the best public health information available and designed to ensure the safety of our students and staff. I would like to thank all the educators and local leaders who have worked hard over the summer to make the, all the preparations for reopening our schools. Starting today in our K-12 education system, we can mark the transition from one phase of our work to another as we shift our focus from preparing to reopening schools to addressing the educational needs of all our students during this unprecedented pandemic. We will be doing this work while also attending to the larger public health concerns because until we have a vaccine, the threat of the virus will be with us. All Vermonters will need to continue to follow the guidance from our health department if we are to keep our schools open. The sacrifices and hard work of all Vermonters has given us the opportunity to move forward now with the work of educating our children. We can also anticipate having a vaccine at some point and moving into a recovery phase of this emergency. To that end, I thought I would take some time to make some observations about how I see the next several months playing out in our K-12 system. Firstly, in education, we often talk about interventions. Interventions are actions we take within a school or school system to address the learning needs of students. Our number one intervention right now is quite simply the act of reopening our schools. Reopening our schools is the best thing we can do for our children. Reopening our schools allows us to reestablish the routines, relationships, and activities of school life that are essential to the well-being and healthy development of our students. Our priority now needs to be on the social and emotional well-being of our students. All school activities and routines for the next several weeks, including academics and extracurricular activities, should prioritize the social and emotional needs of students. I think the social and emotional needs of our students will remain a priority throughout this emergency, but I anticipate we will be putting an increased emphasis on academics later this month if we can make this, the shift to step three as described in our guidance. Our health guidance anticipates moving from step two to step three after this initial reopening period if the conditions for COVID-19 continue to remain positive. Under step three, schools can follow less stringent requirements when implementing in-person instruction. If we can make the transition to step three in a few weeks, I expect schools will be able to put a renewed focus on academics with the advent of more in-person learning, which will probably result from the shift to step three. We also know that considering the prospect of flu season and moving to more indoor schooling as temperatures get cooler, that we need to take advantage of this time in late September to maximize in-person learning opportunities for students. We will likely be implementing some form of mixed in-person or remote learning until we have a vaccine and can safely move into a recovery phase. To support hybrid learning, the agency will be working with educators and schools to identify and scale innovative practices in hybrid learning that seem to work best. Our team at the agency is currently working with educators from around the state to address this need. Based on this collaboration, we will be publishing guidance on the following topics soon. Guidance on physical education and a support guide for physical education co-developed with SHAPE, which is the Society of Health and Physical Educators of Vermont. Lab science guidelines and supports co-developed with Vermont science educators. And priority instructional content for math, developed with the input from Vermont math experts and in alignment with national recommendations. We will also be putting significant effort behind developing guidance on student support systems, including guidance for meeting the needs of our students who have disabilities. 
We know that this emergency has been very difficult and challenging for our education system on many levels. But we also know that necessity can be the mother of invention. And therefore, we need to be alert when new, effective ideas emerge. In, anticip in anticipation of the need to identify new innovations, one of the first things we did when this emergency began was to form a task force of Vermont educators, business leaders, and other key individuals to think about the strategic implications of this emergency on Vermont's K-12 education system. Members of this task force included Raphael Adamek, who's the Director of Instructional Technology for the Windsor Central Supervisory Union, Bridget Assay, a school board member for Montpelier Roxbury Public Schools, Janet Bombardier, Chief Technology Officer and COO for Chroma Technology, Dr. Heather Boucher, Deputy Secretary of the Agency of Education, Jean Collins, Superintendent for the Rutland Northeast Supervisory Union, Morgan Crossman, Executive Director of Building Bright Futures, Jessica Carolus, a division director for the Agency of Education. Matt Dunn, founder and executive director of the Center on Rural Innovation. John Downs, the director of the Tarrant Institute. Scott Farr, superintendent and director of the River Valley Technical Center. Jason Finley, career development coordinator for the Randolph Technical Center. Tammy Frechette, special educator for North Country Union High School. Sharon Howell, the new headmaster of St. Johnsbury Academy. Martha Martell, a classroom teacher at Wilson Central School. Mike McGraith, Assistant Executive Director of the Vermont Principals Association. Juliet Longchamp, Director of Professional Programs for Vermont NEA. Tom Lovett, the Headmaster Emeritus of St. Johnsbury Academy. Randy Lowe, Superintendent for the Bennington Rutland Supervisory Union. Martha Santa Maria, a classroom teacher at Middlebury Union Middle School. Chuck Scranton, Executive Director of the Roland Foundation and Lisa Ventress, president of the Vermont Business Roundtable. This group, led by Dr. Andrew Jones, who's the director of curriculum for the Mill River School District and president of the Vermont Curriculum Leaders Association, has been meeting throughout the summer and recently completed its work. I'm pleased to announce that later this week, we'll be publishing the group's report and its recommendations. I would like to thank the task force members for their hard work over the summer. In summary, I expect this initial period of school reopening will have a focus on meeting the social and emotional needs of our students. If the conditions support it and we are able to transition to step three later this month, I expect districts will put more focus on the academic and learning needs of students while the conditions remain positive to maximize opportunities for in-person instruction. In anticipation of having a vaccine and eventually moving into a recovery phase of this emergency, we will also begin to work in describing the strategic implications of this emergency on our education system and begin a conversation about how to enact its most effective innovations across the entire system. That concludes my update. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Levine. Good morning. Before I give an update on the numbers, I will share two important developments with regard to testing. As the governor said, testing has been key to our ability to understand and track the presence of COVID-19 across the state. And with expert contact tracing, isolation, and quarantine to limit the spread of the virus. To date, we have tested more than 146,000 people nearly one quarter of our population through pop-up test sites operated by the Health Department and the Vermont National Guard and through testing by hospitals and healthcare providers. A few months ago, Walgreens joined in a pilot testing effort and now operates a drive-through site in Essex Junction. And today, I'm pleased to announce, based on a pilot test with the Health Department, that Kinney Drugs has entered a partnership with the UVM Medical Center and will begin testing this week at 11 different locations around the state. Some will begin as early as tomorrow and others over the next two weeks. Locations and dates of testing are being added to our map now so folks can make appointments. I'm also pleased to announce that working together with the Agency of Digital Services, we have created a new online system that facilitates registration and results reporting. 
This will speed up the reporting of test results by making them available electronically through email for people who get tested at one of our sites. This comprehensive tool ensures that results are more easily accessible while still protecting the privacy of the individual's health information. We are in the final phases of testing and making recommendations and improvements to this new system so Vermonters can continue to access testing when they need it. And while I'm on the topic, a reminder about testing. We know many Vermonters want to do the right thing to protect their friends and family. And for some people, the urge is to get tested. But while anyone can get tested, not everyone needs to get tested. The best way to protect yourself from COVID-19 and keep our schools and economy open is to follow all of the key prevention practices, wearing a mask, keeping a distance of six feet from others, avoiding crowded spaces, especially indoor spaces, washing your hands a lot, and staying home when you're sick. If you think you should get tested, talk with your health care provider. The health department recommends testing if you have symptoms of the virus, if you have had close contact within six feet for about 15 minutes or more with someone who has the virus, or if you are referred by your health care provider for another reason. We do not recommend people get tested before visiting another household or attending a gathering just to make sure that they're okay. Testing only tells you if you have COVID-19 on the day you were tested. You could have already been exposed, but may have been tested too early for it to show up on the test, or you could be exposed to COVID-19 after you are tested. Testing is not prevention, and a negative test does not necessarily mean it's safe to gather with others. Let's look at our health update now. As of yesterday, total number of cases, 1654. Total number of deaths, 58. I can tell you that our last death was on July 28th. That was 41 days ago. The slope of our uh, curve hasn't changed in a long, long time. And now looking at the number of new cases over time, the last four days have been relatively uneventful from the standpoint of numbers, with 12 cases total ranging from one to five on any given day. I'm happy to report that the outbreak in Killington has had only one new case added for a total of 18 cases. And the yield from the Pico Killington uh, pop-up was zero new cases. Our percent positivity rate last week remained in the 0.3% range. And since March to date, it has been in the 1% range. We obviously will be very focused on discerning the impact, if any, over the next couple, couple of weeks of a number of current events. Obvious first one is Labor Day. But I must say, in the times I was out, I was very impressed with what I observed in the behavior of fellow Vermonters. The Burlington protests, which have gone to reasonably high numbers, but I continue again to be impressed with the percentage of people masking. And of course, college reopening, and as you just heard, K through 12 reopening. I'll now turn it back to the governor. And with that, we'll open it up for questions. Yeah, really um, taking a look at the hospitality sector, um, particularly our, you know, restaurants uh, and our lodging. Uh, they've been impacted greatly uh, over the last several months, and it's time if we have, uh, again, low positivity rates, uh, low number of cases, and we're successfully opening up schools, uh, that will be the next area that we'll look at. 
And um, I've got a broad band question. I don't know if it's be for you or maybe Secretary French, but uh, so the state, correct me if I'm wrong, but we have a, a broadband grant program that can give uh, families up to $3,000 to run fiber out to their houses. But we're hearing from some viewers um, that are actually in education there, teachers, uh, it's they went so far off the grid that it's going to cost up to $27,000 for them to have a fiber run to their house. Uh, so because of that, they have to teach over the phone to their kids. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, for, for people that are in situations like those, what, what sort of, of resources uh, do, do they have to get plugged in? Well, again, um, we know the challenges with broadband in Vermont and across rural um, uh, America, for that, uh, for that matter. Uh, I'm hope, still hopeful uh, that Congress will take action uh, and that we'll continue to invest in more broadband throughout the states. Uh, in this particular case, I'm not sure that Secretary French will be able to answer that. It's more of a Department of Public Service question. Uh, we can get the answer uh, to that. Uh, I don't believe Commissioner Tierney is on, on the line, but we can get you uh, an answer to that. But, uh, but again, it's, uh, it's problematic uh, for some. Uh, the three thousand uh, dollars to extend the lines was a step forward, but we know we have a long ways to go. Thank you. Um, this question is for Dr. Levine. Um, with the state anticipating a rise in COVID cases due to schools reopening, I'm wondering what the Department of Health is doing to prepare for that potential spike. Well, part of that is tracking data. So that will be no different than it ever is because we track all of the data 24-7 every day of the year. Um, probably what you're referring to more is if there are a sufficient number of cases, that would generate a significant amount of contact tracing. So currently, we're, um, thank goodness, underutilizing our contact tracing workforce uh, and only using uh, probably less than half uh, with the number of cases that we're encountering at this point in time. So we still have a vast reserve in our workforce. Plus we've hired and trained another handful of um, contact tracers to add to that workforce, suspecting uh, in the event that we have a surge in cases, not only with K through 12, but potentially with colleges, with foliage season, things of that sort that we'd have even a second reserve, if you will. So currently, um, an underutilized uh, force, which I hope could continue in that vein, um, but plenty of room for expansion. Okay. And would you consider adding maybe more pop-up testing as well if the numbers really got to? Yeah, so, you know, essentially our modus operandi to date has been when there's an outbreak, doing a pop-up. Um, most recent example was um, in the uh, Rutland and Pico Killington areas uh, over a three day period. Um, with schools, it's a little maybe less complicated uh, because we might not need to do that extent of, tra of tracing, depending on if it's an individual case, if it's a small number in a classroom, versus you know, an entire school, which would be much less likely. Um, and we'd have to try to understand if the family units that those cases came from had anything interesting going on in terms of numbers of people affected, uh, congregate gatherings, things of that sort. But pretty much uh, we do a pop-up on demand if it's needed. Thank you. I just, uh, just want to remind everyone as well uh, the news that uh, Dr. Levine spoke of earlier is great news with kidney drugs with 11 locations. That is increasing the amount of testing we'll be able to perform, as well with the colleges and universities doing their own testing. Uh, and our pop-up testing that we've done over the last few months, we've steadily increased our testing ability, uh, and we continue to look for other opportunities as well. So I think uh, we're in pretty good shape. And, uh, and again, this is uh, positive news with kidney drugs coming on board. Uh, Governor, given the um, these are just starting to change. I'm ignoring that uh, <laughs> at this point in time. But um, 
Is it coming at a good time here as far as our numbers go? You say that they're, uh, the hospitality sector is the next one up. Um, what are we looking at numbers-wise for that? Uh, you know, you know um, again, uh, we know the hospitality sector, uh, the, the most uh, impacted sector in terms of the unemployed. Um, we, we, the vast majority uh, of those uh, still unemployed come from that sector. Uh, so that's why we know we have to pay attention, but it's also where we're most vulnerable when we're inviting more people to come in uh, to our state. So we just have to be strategic, we have to be careful. Everything we've done has been uh, in with that, uh, keeping an eye on that. Uh, but it's time, I think, if we prove ourselves over the next couple of weeks, it's time to open up that sector so they can get through the winter and survive. Uh, and get to the you know more normal times a vaccine maybe between now and spring um, will get us back to where we should be right now you know where we're heading uh, last year you know we were we were um, we were fortunate when we look at our numbers uh, from a budget standpoint you know we were doing very well uh, up until the pandemic hit and probably would have had a record surplus I'm hoping we can just uh, resurrect that get back on our, on the on the path forward uh, into a more vi um, viable economy. Well, if it keeps up and the numbers uh, stay either the same or even less, uh, and you do increase, um, what I'm wondering is the, the possibility that um, we can get back to those numbers and to, um, I mean, the, what I'm trying to say is the areas that, uh, for instance, the ski industry and others they were they were on record pace last year they had right. good snow they had lots of visitors i know in the situation that i'm in on the weekends that uh, we see a lot of people from out of state uh, and they do adhere to our our, our uh, policies but and, and in fact we haven't had any problems uh, yeah i don't get there I don't anticipate uh, that we'll get back to those numbers uh, anytime soon, and it may not be over the next few months. Uh, but again, opening it up as much as we can, because a lot of it's out of our control. Uh, a lot of uh, folks are, are, are apprehensive about traveling themselves until they see a vaccine or, or have faith in, in where they're going. So um, it's not in all in our control. We could open everything up to 100% and still not be at capacity and not uh, get the numbers uh, back to where they were before. So we'll just have to get, continue to do the best we can, prove ourselves, and uh, do this in a measured, responsible way. And, and finally, uh, the number of possible uh, out-of-staters who are actually staying here in Vermont and just staying here because it's, it's safer, or they perceive it as being safer, uh, do we have any handle on those numbers or uh, yeah. how that's going? I'm not sure that we do. I'm not sure how we would collect the, the data either. Um, but, uh, uh, but I mean, I, 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 the numbers speak for themselves. We, we are the safest state in the country uh, in, ter in all respects, uh, but uh, certainly with the pandemic, with a low number of cases, the low positivity rate. Um, so I wouldn't blame anyone for wanting to stay in Vermont for the winter. I'm just curious. Uh, no, I mean, uh, and and this was his vacation. Uh, again, I mean, think about it. The vice president uh, chose Vermont uh, to come and take a couple of days. Uh, it shows, you know, the faith he has uh, and, uh, and what we have, what we're doing. All right, moving to the phones. We'll start with Joe from the Barton Chronicle. Hello. Um, my first question is about um, the proposed supplement to um, unemployment. Where does that stand now? Are, are people getting that three hundred dollars? I, I know it was supposed to end uh, pretty early. Yeah. So, uh, is it over before they've gotten it? Well, it will be backdated. Uh, I don't believe, um, and uh, uh, Commissioner Harrington can uh, can chime in, but um, I, nobody has received that benefit at this point in time, uh, but is retroactive, and they will be receiving the full benefit over this uh, period of time. But, uh, but you're right. I, I think that 
uh, it's it was only designed for three to four weeks so uh, by the time this come in, comes into place uh, they will be um, uh, they will be um, they will be out of out of room uh, in some respects uh, because until Congress takes action uh, they won't be an additional amount of money because that was just uh, that was just FEMA money um. Oh, wait, maybe, can, Joe, if I, if I could, uh, Commissioner Harrington, can you uh, give any more information on that? Uh, thanks, Governor. I'm happy to. Um, you know, the, the first initial three weeks that every state that applies receives um, is back is going to be backdated. In many cases, states, by the time they had applied and received approval, um, they were already talking about backdating. Um, so we're looking at the first week being the week that ends uh, August 1st, the week that ends August 8th, and the week that ends August 15th. Um, the federal government has indicated there may be additional weeks available uh, depending on how the rollout goes. Uh, in here in Vermont, um, we are doing the first step in the eligibility requirement gathering. So uh, individuals will be asked uh, this week uh, and going forward to certify that their disruption in employment is due to COVID-19. Uh, and then from there, we will take that population uh, and identify the rest of the eligibility criteria uh, and then start issuing checks. My hope is that, um, you know, we could start issuing checks uh, as early as next week. Um, if not before, depending on what we receive back from individuals who are able to certify that their work is, has been impacted by COVID-19. Thank you. I have also another question that was asked of me by an acquaintance who is a volunteer uh, EMT person. And he noted that um, the hazard pay uh, was granted to um, professional EMTs, and he is curious as to whether anything can be done, um, not necessarily for the volunteers because they don't expect to get paid, but their organizations, for example, or if there's any kind of recognition, formal or otherwise, that can be granted to people who are volunteering to serve their communities. He said that a number of his colleagues can't go on calls these days because they have uh, some kind of health compromises. And I think to some extent he just thinks that people like him should be recognized for their service to well, the community. Yeah, they certainly should be recognized. We. We do count on volunteers uh, throughout Vermont, whether it's the volunteer fire department or EMTs, uh, and I don't know what we would do uh, without their uh, public service. So uh, in terms of uh, thanking them, I do thank them, uh, but I don't uh, know the particulars of the program. I'm going to ask Secretary Smith to uh, elaborate. Thanks, Joe. That's uh, a pertinent and timely question. Um, we've had we've heard from a lot from the volunteer EMS uh, community on sort of the hazardous hazard pay uh, concept, the grant program. The hazard pay grant program was for um, uh, it, it basically was for those frontline workers in public safety, uh, public health, healthcare, and human services that were, could be based on a payroll uh, aspect for determining how much they would get between $1,200 and $2,000. Uh, obviously, volunteers um, were not um, in that because they weren't getting paid and the payrolls couldn't be checked. However, there is a grant program that's being run through the tax department for municipalities that could include uh, hazard pay for volunteers in in that regard but also the legislature is now looking at how to expand the hazards uh, hazard pay program uh, and included in that 
look-see is, uh, e is the aspect of volunteer EMS. We're working with the legislature. Obviously, it's uh, trying to figure out how you would do a re uh, any sort of hazard pay program without um, a payroll associated to it probably would be in terms of the most expeditious way would be a grant program probably to the municipality in terms of for this specific purpose. But we're looking at, uh, with the legislature, looking at various ways to expand this program. Thank you very kindly. Greg, the County Courier. Hi, Governor. Uh, hope you had a good Labor Day weekend. Um, first off, I, I did get disconnected a little bit quickly last week, and I wanted to acknowledge I, I appreciate your time, even when you asked the hard questions. Um, I'm hoping you could give us an update on uh, state police in Bridgeport uh, that we've spoken about the last few days. Um, I haven't received an update since Friday. Um, maybe. Commissioner Sherling, has there been anything that has uh, transpired between Friday and today? Uh, thank you, Governor. No, uh, just some correspondence from uh, municipal officials in, in Richford uh, thanking us for a prompt response. Is the only uh, the only update I've received. No operational update. Okay. Um, Commissioner Sherling, do you have any I did notice that the state police. Uh, or, or the the Mont Police Academy has 11 troopers uh, being trained right now. Is that a, a move in your administration towards defunding the police or, or uh, that's law enforcement at the Mont? Um, we are constantly uh, training uh, and always have opportunities for more law enforcement uh, amongst the ranks of the Vermont State Police. It's been challenging uh, through the pandemic, uh, even in the academy, and so uh, there's been a, a bit of a, uh, of a um, maybe a, a vacuum in some respects over the last six months there. But uh, we're hoping to get back up to speed and, and uh, continue to train law enforcement throughout Vermont. Anything I should add with that, Commissioner Sherwin? Uh uh, I just add uh, that um, re recruitment uh, for law enforcement remains a challenge, uh, increasingly so in the uh, existing climate, and uh, so that's part of the challenge. The other part of the challenge is the COVID operating environment. So the academy was limited in the total number of recruits that could be trained uh, this session as a result of the COVID distancing requirements that we put in place there. Yeah, and I would also add uh, pre-pandemic. Uh, we have a, had a labor force shortage across all sectors, uh, including law enforcement. Um, so, uh, do, no do one. Do the 11 troopers replace the number of uh, troopers in the state police that believe or have left in the same period of time? Um, we have an annual attrition in the state police of approximately 30 troopers uh, annually. Uh, so, this is a normal, uh, slightly light uh, class typically we shoot for 15 uh, per class but that's the normal uh, attrition rate okay right. and then uh lastly governor again on a labor uh you here uh it's my understanding that vtrans was down about 20 workers in the district 5 may area um with a with a statewide effort not to hire people because of covid and budget issues you know, that may be good now, but when uh, snow flies, it may become a safety issue. What, what's the state have planned for yeah. that? Yeah, well, again, we have a hiring freeze at this point. Um, let's not, you know, I want to underscore uh, that uh, we still have budgetary concerns and we're doing all we can uh, to make sure that we live within our means and we uh, provide the services that we need to. Uh, I, uh, I expect uh, we will uh, be able to continue to plow the roads, keep them safe. Um, but um, but we have to prioritize in certain areas. I might ask um, is Secretary Flynn on. No, okay. Um, but uh, but I will check back in with him. But uh, I have heard uh, no concerns in some respects. We we know uh, what our mission is, uh, and we'll uh, we'll fulfill that mission. Okay. Uh, 
Thank you, Governor. I'll uh, chat with you again on Friday. Thank you. Kat, WCAX. Good morning. I have a couple of logistical questions I'm going to try to clear up for our viewers. Uh, with these new testing partnerships, are these tests going to be free or are they going to cost money? What should people expect? I don't have the answer to that. Maybe Commissioner Levine. Are uh, you talking about the ones through the pharmacies? Yes, like the Kinney Drug Partnership. Yeah, Do people I, expect to need to pay for those? Does insurance I, cover all of it? Like, how, how does that work? I believe they should be treated just like other tests, uh, with insurance being the first stop and not charging the person uh, out of pocket. And is there any restriction on who can go to these? Are they doing, for instance, uh, the test for people who are trying to get out of a quarantine from travel? Right, so the preferential audience for these tests will be the asymptomatic group. So probably the leading uh, sector in that group are people trying to get out of quarantine from travel or potentially people who have been traced as a contact and want to get out of quarantine early uh, as a contact. And then the last kind of logistical question um, I had on that front was how fast people can expect the turnaround time to be for these tests. You know, is it going to be one, two, three days a week? Yeah, so I think that's part of the partnership with UVM Medical Center. So they will be triaged um, as the medical center does. And our turnaround time has been within two days uh, using that method. Uh, earlier on, when Arizona, Texas, Florida were having their huge surges. The private companies, commercial labs like Quest and LabCorp were having very long turnaround times. Even those operations have now uh, been able to come in at just a couple of days turnaround. So we don't anticipate there being long turnaround times for really anybody for testing. Thank you. Mike Donahue, The Islander. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Governor, I was wondering if you had any re reaction to the new lawsuit filed by several Vermonters seeking uh, an injunction blocking the distribution of mail-in ballots by way of mass mailing to all people on the voter statewide voter checklist. Uh, I noticed the lawsuit notes that you had pointed out a flaw in the temporary election law passed by the legislature, and that was one of the reasons you didn't sign it, but just wondering what your reaction to this lawsuit. Um, I wasn't uh, aware that a lawsuit had been filed at this point, but uh, um, from my standpoint, uh, I believe that people should uh, vote. I think the mail-in uh, type of uh, approach, um, while it could be as new, um, I think it could, it could have been done in a different way. Um, the reality is that's the way it's going to be done in Vermont, and I believe that uh, uh, it will be done successfully. The Secretary of State uh, is uh, is the um, is the lead on this, uh, and uh, uh, and he has said, um, and he's the expert on elections. Uh, he has said that uh, he has uh, no qualms about this being successful. This might be a better question um, for um, maybe for the Secretary of State uh, in terms of his response to the uh, to the lawsuit because I, I just I wasn't aware of it okay thank you very much appreciate it Wilson ring the AP hi Rebecca especially Lisa Rafke Wilson boss today um, I'm wondering uh, Secretary French if um, today being the first day of for schools to restart. Um, have you heard from districts about how it's going today? Uh, are there any issues or anything that's going well? <laughs> class, class half full. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, no, I haven't yet. It's, uh, I think, a little early, but I'll, uh, I'll check in with the superintendents. We have a regular uh, weekly call on Thursday, so. Okay, and then do you know um, roughly what percentage of Students are, or districts are have students back for in-person learning today. Yeah, Something it's like we we 
Yeah, when you say in person, are you meaning 100% in person? Uh, we have, dis most districts are in a, a disposition of hybrid learning, so there's some version of in person uh, being enacted today, but it's hard to uh, say, you know, what, what districts are just doing solely doing in person. Okay. All right, thank you. Welcome. Mara Brooks. Mara Brooks, Hardwick Gazette, star six to unmute. All right, we'll go to Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. I wanted to ask you about the Global Warming Solutions Act. It could come to your desk pretty soon. Is there any, under any conditions, that you would sign it with the provision that any individual could sue the state? Yeah, I, uh, you know, I outlined in a letter uh, to the legislature, as you've seen, uh, some of my concerns uh, about this. Uh, and uh, there is a path forward, and we can work at this on this together. Uh, so at this point, it doesn't appear uh, that they're, at least from the House perspective, I heard, haven't heard from the Senate, uh, for, from the House uh, perspective, uh, they feel uh, that they have um, gone as far as they can. Uh, but you never know with the legislature. It still uh, has an opportunity to get us all on board and move forward with this. Uh, but, uh, but I have some, you know, some, some concerns that have not been met at this point that I think are detrimental to the state. It, and, and also related to that, is there? Can you anticipate? You know that the um, the carbon reductions are, are very very strict. Does that seem reasonable, or would it would even within the realm of possibility from your perspective? Well, again, uh, you know, um, climate change is real, and we have to get serious about carbon reductions. And and uh, I believe moving to electric vehicles is the the fastest way to do that. And and try and really focus on that area because that's that's where the the, the biggest uh, the lowest hanging fruit is in some respects because that's where most of the carbon emissions uh, uh, come from. Sixty percent is from transportation related issues. So uh, focusing on electric vehicles, I think, is the right approach. We've been doing that over the last couple of years and incentivizing uh, the purchase of electric vehicles, having charging stations, putting infrastructure in place. Um, so uh, again, I think it's doable. I mean, the, the path we're on is is doable, uh, but uh, but trying to get everyone on board, I think, is uh, is important uh, to the cause. And instead of uh, in the in the courts and in litigation, uh, let's all get uh, together and uh, make this happen. Great, thank you very much. Guy Page. Uh, this is a, no. Yes, this is a question for Secretary French. Uh, Secretary French, there, there's been a, uh, the, the new policy on school bus. I have a question about, uh, it says not only do children need to be masked, but the windows need to be open as well. Uh, and that's, I guess, in extremely inclement weather. Uh, and I, I wonder, uh, if you could explain why why that's not overkill, uh, and and also uh, concern about uh, especially this time of year, bees flying through an open window, maybe stinging an allergic child whose epipens are at school, uh, is that something that's been considered? Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, just to back up on that a little bit, we haven't issued any new guidance pertaining to school buses. Uh, in the original health guidance, I believe, has remained sort of intact, and that was published in June 17th. Uh, mm -hmm. We did, as I mentioned earlier, we um, anticipate moving uh, to step three in our guidance, but in our original guidance, we did decide to open busing at step three initially, uh, just to address a lot of logistic issues. And a lot of the issues you refer to are recommendations, not requirements. Uh, certainly, I think pertaining to windows, those are recommendations we'd like to encourage in classrooms as well uh, to uh, to improve air circulation. Uh, but I think still common sense will prevail in the case of bees and other things flying through windows. Um, 
but I think you know the school districts are well well equipped to deal with those issues. The issues of epipens and so forth are ones that predate this this emergency, and I know uh, they'll address them uh, and are are fully capable of doing so. So you're saying these are just recommendations; they're not they're not requirements, and school districts can use their own discretion. Yeah, I've been there, there was. I just I'm make, sorry, no, I just make the point. This is there's nothing new relative to school bus direction. Uh, this has been around since June. Uh, some of it is a requirement. Other parts of it are recommendations. But I think specifically, when you start talking about issues, specific issues of opening a window or not, uh, those are recommendations for folks. Okay, there, there was a, an August 11th document uh, specifically referenced that. Uh, but oh, okay. Uh, thank you very much for that, uh, Secretary French. Uh, Governor, I've got a question for you about uh, your policing executive order. Uh, you, you note that local and state government uh, are discussing, quote, an end to qualified immunity for law enforcement officers, removal of police from schools, um, which merit open and informed debate and consideration in Vermont's communities and in the legislature. By raising those issues, are you saying that you are inclined to support legislation for taking the police out of schools and ending qualified immunity, or are you just saying uh, you, you know it's being discussed? Yeah, I, I'm in support of having the dialogue uh, and uh, and leaving it to the districts uh, to determine what they want to do. Um, Commissioner Sherling, are you still on? Um, do you want to comment on that provision in particular? I am, Governor. Thank you. Um, I think you uh, you nailed it on the uh, on the first answer that uh, the choice to have law enforcement in schools is a district by district and school by school uh, decision. Um, I don't think I have anything to add to that. How is this, uh, Governor? Is this related to to COVID in any way, or is this just would this be an executive order even if there were no state of emergency? Yeah, this this has nothing to do with the state of emergency. In some respects, it's. Uh, it's all about uh, the racial disparity we're seeing uh, rise throughout the country and something that we need to address. Do you want to take a position on uh, taking police out of schools and qualified immunity? I mean, is there, do you have a point of view on that? No, I'm, I'm in favor of leaving it as I have, you know, with the in-person versus uh, uh, remote learning uh, in terms of opening up our, our, our schools at this point. Um, I'm, I'm leaving it to the districts, but we need to have the conversation. You know, racism is real, and uh, we continue to see uh, it rear its ugly head uh, almost weekly at this point, and we're not immune to it in, in the state of Vermont. So we have to, again, address this uh, way we're doing it in a responsible way. Having the dialogue, I think, is important uh, to coming uh, to uh, at least some measure of working together uh, because it's literally in our hands, just like, you know, we talked about the pandemic and, and how uh, taking uh, steps, uh, wearing a mask, staying six feet apart, staying home when sick and so forth uh, is so important, those simple steps. Um, ending racism in our country uh, is literally in our hands. The government can't do this, uh, but we can individually. It's about how we treat each other and it's about a mindset and we have to work on this because uh, we have we have a lot of work to do, and uh, again, we're we're doing our part in this manner. It's not over. I mean, there's going to be ongoing conversations about this, and we have to again have the the tough conversations that need to be had. Okay, thank you. Avery WCAX. Governor, some new data from the transportation company Unigroup has said that far more people moved to Vermont uh, between March 1st and the middle of August. Obviously, the state's been trying to get more people here. What has the thought process been behind with this influx of people keeping them here once hopefully things kind of return to normalcy within the next year and a half? Yeah, again, um, I talked about this a lot pre-pandemic uh, about the need for more people, more families in the state to fill our empty schools, 30,000 fewer kids in our schools over the last 20 years, uh, a shrinking workforce in terms of uh, number of people available for work. Um, so in some respects, what we need to do is bring more people in. And, and again, uh, selling that we're one of the safest states in the, in the country, 
uh, it seems to be working in some respects. Uh, but keeping them here uh, takes an economy that works, you know, making Vermont more affordable um, and uh, focusing on the economy in general. Uh, I think we'll, we'll continue to, to keep people here once, uh, once they get more complacent. So uh, we're on the right track. I believe that uh, we'll see uh, hopefully an influx of people over the next uh, couple of years. Uh, but we have to do our part to make sure that we keep them here by making it, making it affordable. Thank you. Kevin, seven days. Hi, Governor. Thanks for taking the call. I also have a question about the Global Warming Solutions Act. Um, can you explain further, given that Vermont has missed uh, one climate emissions reduction target several years ago and is not on track to meet current uh, pledge under the Paris Accord, what's so uh, difficult or offensive about um, having a system in place that would uh, hold the state accountable to those pledges. Uh, can you explain a little more well, about this, that? Yeah, there's different provisions uh, within that I have uh, issues with, uh, with the act itself. Uh, and one of them is uh, making the state uh, financially liable uh, and uh, for from a lawsuit. And uh, so I don't believe that's the right approach. Uh, I just believe that uh, we need to put uh, um, laws in place uh, that will help uh, get us to where we want to go. I don't believe uh, using the threat of a lawsuit as a, as a good approach uh, to changing behavior. So what, what's, the, what's the mechanism that would be in place to ensure that the state meets its greenhouse gas emissions reduction target that's not a judge or uh, lawyers or others? Well, again, just putting it into the court and, uh, and finding the state isn't going to change behavior. Uh, I believe, uh, again, as we started down this path, I believe that uh, the electrification uh, using uh, electric vehicles is, is the answer. 60% of our emissions are through transportation, and we have started moving in that direction. I believe that we can further um, uh, incentivize, uh, work towards uh, changing behavior in that area, and I think it's exciting uh, in a lot of respects. So um, I think getting people on board again is uh, about proving ourselves and to, to show uh, that there's a different path and it, uh, you know, it isn't uh, using uh, carbon emitting vehicles. It's, uh, it's through uh, electric vehicles, I believe, EVs. Yeah, I, I, think a lot, I think a lot of people agree with you on that. I just, it's uh question of how to hold the state accountable for the emission targets. What happens if we're coming up on a deadline and, and we're just far off from those goals? Uh, what will, what mechanism would be in place to ensure that the state right. does more to try to meet those goals? I, th I think, I think it depends on, on where we're, we're failing. Uh, and again, uh, this isn't something that uh, can be done in any one or two or three years. Um, it's going to take some time, and I believe that it will ramp up. I, I've said this all along with the uh, electrification of vehicles. Uh, we're not going to see this overnight, uh, but uh, in ramping up towards this, I think the trajectory will, will uh, further increase um, the closer we get to acceptance and the closer we get to having more vehicles available. The price comes down, more incentives, uh, more charging stations, having everything in place uh, will uh, will allow us to uh, to st uh, more steeply ramp up to where we want to go. So um, it may not be in the first uh, few years, uh, but uh, but I would say uh, you know again that trajectory looks different in, in my from my perspective than it does for others. It's not a a, a slope that is consistent. I think it's going to increase uh, as we get closer to, uh, to to more acceptability as well as new technology. Okay, uh, thanks for that. Last question is um, about the latest buy local program with the $30 coupons that were launched today. Obviously, that's a, uh, that's a novel and um, uh, uh, economic development plan to put money in the pockets of, of area businesses. I signed up for it at 11 o'clock, hoping to get my $30 coupon, and I have not heard back yet with a verification code. There seems to be some uh, hiccup in the... Uh, in the website there. If you had an update on that, you probably haven't since you've been in the press conference. This but is, what's your optimism about that program? This um, is my first update from you, Kevin. Um, you're welcome. 
Uh, maybe Commissioner or Secretary Curley uh, could uh, respond to this. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? We can. Okay, great. Um, yes, we are aware that the site is having trouble. We have uh, great demand for the program already. Over 10,000 Vermonters are trying to get signed up. So um, the system is working, but I understand that the um, codes are still uh, a little delayed. But um, it, we're just asking for folks' patience, and uh, hopefully those codes will be coming your way very shortly. Okay, and then um, can someone just give me a quick summary of the of the larger, uh, the more aggressive, uh, similar program that I think is in the works or at least under consideration? Fifty million dollars, I believe. Yeah. So um, the house was, uh, was not a, a large fan of of the fifty million dollar uh, expansion of the pilot program. So uh, you know the Senate may see it differently, and so it, it's still being discussed as we speak. Um, but uh, a lot, a lot more to come, I'm sure, this week on that front. In the meantime, we're very excited about the interest that the, the pilot program, the 500,000, has um, has received. More than 1,300 businesses uh, have signed up, and again, that's all Vermont local businesses. And as I mentioned already this morning, we've seen more than 10,000 Vermonters signal their interest in. Um, and buying local and having an opportunity to, to receive a savings. Okay, thanks very much, everyone. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Andrew, Caledonian Record. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me? We can. Uh, uh, I, uh, this is for Secretary French, um, I guess. Uh, I'm wondering. Uh, do you have a date circled on the calendar for when you feel like you and the AOE will have uh, turned a corner on the reopening in terms of whether it's been successful or not and what the metrics are that you'll be looking for to, uh, to make that determination? Yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> as I alluded to, that transition to step three, I think will mark, mark that change. Um, and actually, I think we'll look significantly to our uh, partners at the Department of Health to uh, make that decision. Uh, but we'll be looking closely at the metrics that you've, you've become aware of, you know, that we review every Friday. Um, we're looking for that, any change in those metrics as a result of the K-12 opening. Uh, but I would think in a couple of weeks we'll be able to uh, make that transition if conditions remain positive. And is your sole focus then at this point just on the health metrics or are there educational metrics that you also will want to keep tabs on going forward? Well, in terms of the transition to step three, I think that's largely dependent on the health metrics. Uh, but we'll be in this, this once a longer period of working under a hybrid model that's uh, dependent on a lot of logistical issues and we'll be attending and supporting districts uh, as they move forward in this, this situation. But. Um, I think in terms of the larger health concern, yes, we'll be looking at uh, those data to see uh, to what extent we can make that transition to level three. And um, how important is it from your perspective at this point uh, for schools to find their way to, to maximizing the amount of the in-person uh, learning that they're offering their kids? I think it's it's a you know it's a critical uh, moment we have, but I think you know once again, as I mentioned. Uh, the priority right now is just to reopen schools and to focus on the routines and relationships and not to put too much pressure, I think, on this initial opening period around academic uh, needs. But I think that will come uh, sort of naturally. Um, I do expect uh, if the weather remains good and uh, you know, our data remains good, that we'll, we'll see an increased focus on in-person learning and um, the, the system itself will start to focus on assessing the impact of the emergency on students. And we'll make that transition. So I think I, you know, I know school districts will feel a sense of urgency to start to uh, reach out and, and take those steps to remediate uh, student learning. Uh, but for right now, I mean, our focus I think really needs just to be on reopening school and uh, meeting the social and emotional needs of our students. Okay, thank you. Liam, VPR. Hi, um, I was wondering about the, uh, the executive order around public safety, Governor. You, you laid out a number of action items, um, you know, around making some data more publicly available, a statewide youth support policy, a universal reporting for misconduct and uh, allegations. And I'm wondering when you'd like to see those initiatives uh, actually go live and, and be things that are available for, you know, 
are being used? Yeah, I mean, some of them might take more time than others, but just as soon as possible. The body-worn cameras is an area that, uh, that we're actively working on as we speak. Um, the use of force policy is something that, uh, that uh, we, we can work on immediately. Uh, and uh, it's just going to take uh, a little bit of time for some of the others, but training, uh, data, and, and so forth. Um, again, just as soon as it's practical, we're working on many of these initiatives right now. Commissioner Sherling? Uh, let me just get the reaction from Commissioner Sherling as well. Thank you, Governor. Uh, on the data front, we're making significant progress, progress there in the acquisition of a new uh, records management system that will allow for um, additional data to be uh, publicly available in a variety of different formats. Um, the policy development components are, uh, are actively under development together with a variety of partners and stakeholders and uh, as our uh, development of, uh, of options for uh, both the governor and the, and the legislature to consider on a, on a host of other uh, initiatives, we're working as, as swiftly as possible uh, on all of the things mentioned uh, in the governor's executive order. In terms of the, uh, the reporting of improper allegations, you know, misconduct allegations, um, how much information, governor, would you support releasing uh, in that portal? Like, the, the names of officers accused of misconduct, the department, they just, what level of detail are you, would you like to see in that, in that portal? Yeah, just as being just as transparent as possible while respecting uh, the rights of individuals. So we'll determine that uh, as we move forward. But, uh, but again, just being just as transparent as possible. I mean, do you have some ideas of what that might be? look like? I mean, what, what does that transparent possible mean to you? Well, again, within the provisions of protecting an individual's rights, uh, but uh, and as well as uh, maybe some union rights as well, uh, we're trying to, we'll try and meander our way through that and uh, provide as much transparency as we possibly can uh, within those parameters. Thank you. John, News 7. John, News 7, star 6 to unmute. All right, we'll move to Ann Wallace-Allen, VT Digger. Hi, Ann. can you hear me? We can. Um, I have two questions. Um, one is, I'm wondering how many of the child care hubs are actually open today and how many kids that involves. I'll have to ask Secretary Smith for that. And thank you. This is the latest information that I have. First of all, I, I want to thank the team at uh, AHS who worked over the uh, Labor Day weekend to uh, make sure that there were facilities up and running here uh, as schools open. Schools are going to be opening at different times. Programs are going to be opening at different times this week, so I'll give you what I have right now. We're up to 24 hub programs, up from three from Friday. Uh, those 24 hubs will serve approximately 73 different site locations. As I mentioned last week, Hubs um, have different locations within those, uh, those hubs. We had envisioned hubs just being one location, but what we found out as we sort of evolved in this process is that a hub can have multiple locations uh, for children and, and in actuality can have a lot of slots within those uh, multiple locations. During the, the first week, this first week of school, active and identified hubs have the capacity to provide over 6,450 slots for school-aged children during remote learning days. As of Monday afternoon, that's yesterday, 3,484 of those slots were already filled. Uh, it's important to remember that the hubs are aligning to the schedules uh, of the local needs. Different school districts have different time schedules, different days that they're open, and in terms of in-classroom in versus 
um, the hybrid model. And so we're aligning all of that uh, with these hubs to those various locations, to those various schedules. Um, Vermont After School continues to work with entities that have uh, come forward looking to provide school age care. There are also 14 additional potential hub locations where uh, hub applications are in prog progress with details being confirmed uh, as we speak. And uh, Vermont After School will pass these additional locations on to uh, DCF to continue the vetting process. I suspect that when we all said and done, we'll have nearly 50 hub locations with multiple, multiple, excuse me, 50 hubs with multiple, multiple locations where um, these children will be going for childcare. I do want to point out now that I got the podium and in, in um, that we are seeking additional hub sites in a few areas around the state that we have so far been unsuccessful in getting those locations. And I'll just mention the locations that we would like to work with after school. After school would like to work with somebody in these locations to uh, set up a hub. That would be Randolph, Manchester, and its surrounding towns, Grand Isle County, and and uh, in towns around St. Albans and including Swanton. But um, there are, there's been sufficient progress uh, as we've moved forward here. Um, 6,450 slots and slots are available slots. We decided to go with slots because it gives, uh, this will all depend on parents and when they use the child care centers and when they don't. And again, Ultimately, we think we'll be up to 9,000 slots ultimately in this, in this prog uh, process. And if schools go back to um, uh, five days a week in-person learning, we're probably going to reduce this as we move forward uh, because of the n n there won't be a need for this. As I said, this is a system that we stood up uh, on top of the existing child care system and is a temporary system and ready um, and can be dismantled after the need is uh, is done. What about staffing for all of these? Have, have you had any trouble finding people to work at these clubs or is that what you said you're looking for location? Is that part of what you mean? Well, in, in these first initial ones where you are, um, we, you know, we're, we're got the slots, we have the staffing to get the slots up. Obviously, staffing has been a challenge as we move forward, and we're certainly looking at various ways to um, get those um, additional staffing uh, challenges. Um, uh, you know, Vermont after school, those additional um, slots filled and and staffed, and Vermont after school is focusing on uh, recent unemployed college graduates. Uh, current college graduates who are maybe engaged in remote learning themselves, older high school students unemployed. Um, the governor mentioned this the other day. We have 40,000 that are unemployed in, in Vermont. We need you. Uh, and qualified adults of any age and parents of high school or college age students who are qualified as well. Um, I would urge to uh, contact DCF and the after school program uh, to, uh, to get us to where we need to go. We've done an incredible amount of work in the last three weeks. We still have some to go. And as I mentioned in the beginning, um, this is a Herculean task to get this system up and running um, with the realization that we weren't going to have it all up and running by, the, by today. But boy, have we come a long way in getting it up and running uh, to meet some of the needs of childcare out there. Um, so it, it sounds like the upshot is that you think that you will have the, the number that your goal um, of 9,000 slots, you will have staffing for that? 
Um, eventually, we will have staffing for that. Right now, we have 6,450 slots. Our goal is to have 9,000 slots, and we will gear, gear it up. Now, not everybody comes online in schools um, in the same way, so we're trying to gear, like I said, gear up to the districts. Okay, um, thanks. I have another question. Sorry about barking dogs. Um, you have a question? I, I think yeah, I actually think it's for Dr. Levine. Um, when we go back to testing results, I'm wondering, right now there's a lot of discrepancies on timing for the results, and you guys mentioned that, but I was just hoping to get a little bit more information about are people, is it going to be standardized when people get the results, and is that window going to be closed a little bit? So that people people get their tests, know when they're going to get their test results, um, and are going to get them sooner. Yeah, so let me clarify the question for everyone, and then you can tell me if I'm on the right track. There's when the test result is available, because the lab has run the specimen and they have a result, and then there is when an individual finds out that result. So for the first part, right. for, the, for the first part, right. uh, clearly we believe uh, Vermonters are now getting, uh, or Specimens are now being resulted out within a 48-hour period. At least as of last week, that was true, and I'm hoping that's still true uh, today. The second part, with the electronic reporting system, enables people to get pretty instantaneous uh, notion of their result uh, if they have uh, access to email. But we've already instituted systems of people calling um, so that uh, people can get the results quickly. These are especially important, of course, for the negative results, which are the majority, as you've seen uh, in the presentation. So the problem that we've encountered in the past is if you have a negative result, finding out for real that that result was negative, not just no news is good news, but actually getting your result. Initially, it began with mail and um, Mail takes more time than any other mechanism, so people were not always getting it in a timely fashion that way. Then we moved to a phone calling system and brought in really a whole uh, panel of uh, callers to help expedite that. Now I think we have really what's the fastest, which will be pretty instantaneous once the result is available. It can be uh, accessed electronically by email. So those should all go, you know, within that window of time. Uh, shouldn't take much more than the 48 hours that um, they should be getting uh, resulted out on anyways. Okay, um, thanks. And last but not least, um, about payment. As I understand it now, the test the state is paying for the test that the state is doing. So um, you guys are saying that if you go get tested at Kinney Drugs, you, you have to submit your insurance or pay for it? Yes. Whereas you can still get it for free from the state? You, well, you still won't be paying for it if uh, you go and present your insurance. So I guess you could use the word it's free either way to the person. If they have insurance, yeah. True. <laughs> but we have mechanisms for people without insurance or in part of Medicaid to get their studies paid for as well. So we have heard stories of people being charged uh, for their tests, but that should not be the reality for any specific Vermont. Okay, sounds good. Um, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Levine. That concludes today's briefing. We'll see you again on Friday. Thank you very much. Thank uh you. -huh.